An infrastructure deal in Washington is lifting hopes for new roads and bridges here in Iowa. We sit down with Iowa transportation and engineering experts on this infrastructure edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, August 6th edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. This week in Washington, lawmakers continued to hammer out differences on infrastructure legislation. Back here in Iowa, leaders are primed to spend any new funds on everything from road and bridge repairs to expanding broadband. So what are the priorities and challenges for Iowa if an infrastructure bill is passed? To talk about it, we've gathered a pair of Iowa experts. Jim McCauley is Power Systems Engineering Professor at Iowa State University. And Stu Anderson is the Director of the Transportation Development Division at the Iowa DOT. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. It's good to have you with Thank us. You. Thank, you, Thank you. Thanks for making time for us. Also joining us across the table, Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa, and Aaron Murphy is Des Moines bureau chief for Lee Enterprises. Stuart Anderson, we'll start with you. This infrastructure bill that David just referenced, and a note to our viewers, we're taping this on Friday mm -hmm. morning. It may change by the time this airs. Um, what is in it for Iowa in terms of roads, bridges, and airports? Yeah, so this bill, as you mentioned, it's being debated as we speak. Uh, I think the Senate is hoping to vote on it yet this weekend, early next week. And it's, it's a massive bill, 2,702 pages covering all um, manners of infrastructure. But definitely a large component of that is transportation related of about $550 billion of new spending in this bill. About half of that is for transportation. And Iowa definitely would see significant increases in formula funding for highways and public transit. We're roughly estimating about a 40% increase in federal investment in those modes, but also significant funding for aviation, hopefully our lock and dam system. It looks like there's some money for the Corps of Engineers in there as well. So really broad uh, uh, categories of transportation investment in this bill. Jim McCauley, what's your analysis of this bill? as it stands right now? So I'm primarily interested in the electric infrastructure part of mm -hmm. it. And uh, of the 2,702 pages, I think <laughs> 550 of them are devoted to energy. Uh, and of that, about 90 to 100 pages are really focused on uh, the, the grid and uh, particularly uh, resilience uh, is a big issue. So I'm very uh, sort of optimistic about the uh, interest in uh, emphasis on transmission in particular. I think that's a real need for the state of Iowa and also for the really for, for the nation. Itself. So why, would why that do mean... you say that that's a real interest to the state of Iowa, the resilience part of it? So um, <laughs> resilience is uh, a, a, an important topic er everywhere. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, recently in Iowa, a year ago almost exactly uh, now, uh, where we had the derecho that uh, um, caused a lot of interruptions, uh, and that was really a result of you know, an extreme event. Uh, we saw something similar happen in Texas, and of course we've been uh, watching the wildfires in California. So uh, the ability of the electric infrastructure to be resilient to these kind of uh, very, what used to be very rare events, and now may not be so rare, uh, is uh, gaining in importance. And so we, we really like to see that additional funding. And it looks to me like uh, that funding may come to, from analysis of the bill, through the state, 
uh, as well as through uh, very small rural communities. And so there's sort of trying to get at it from both directions. So, so let's back out and ask us if each of you take the big picture view. What is the current condition of, and, and Jim McCauley will start with you, what is the current condition of Iowa's uh, electric grid? You mentioned other states that have had issues, and, and we had issues with the derecho last year. Uh, Texas had issues earlier this year with theirs. So w w what does Iowa's electric grid currently look like? So, uh, you know, there's uh, sort of three sectors, generation, transmission, and distribution. Uh, the difference between transmission and distribution is uh, sort of the capacity and the voltage level. Uh, transmission, the large uh, power lines that you see, distribution, the ones running down the street. So uh, my view is that the electric utility companies in the state of Iowa has, have really done a good job over the past uh, 15, 20 years maintaining the infrastructure. You see uh, ITC has uh, uh, invested uh, many, many millions of dollars in their transmission grid. Uh, Mid-American Energy, of course, has built out our wind energy infrastructure uh, in a unique fashion, unlike anyone in the country. Uh, Alliant Energy has, uh, has also been investing heavily in the distribution. So I think it's good. But the point is that uh, you know, what we're seeing today is an increase in extreme events, events for which uh, most of this kind of infrastructure was not really built to uh, withstand. So is the answer burying some of these? Well, there's multiple answers. Uh, and uh, burying power lines is uh, part, of the, uh, part of the solution, but mainly at the lower voltage level. So uh, I live in Ames. Uh, I was out of power during the derecho for a, a week. And, uh, and if, if we would have had the, the, the lines running down the street underground, you know, that, that would have helped and, and that could be done. It probably can't be done economically at the transmission level. So undergrounding transmission is, is probably not as much of an option. There you really need to harden the, 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 um, the structures in the lines themselves. Stu Anderson, give us the condition of Iowa's roads and bridges report. Yeah, so um, Iowa has a lot of roadway infrastructure about 115,000 miles of roads and 24,000 bridges. It's a lot of infrastructure, but it's important infrastructure to help provide mobility for Iowans and maybe more importantly, help get our agricultural and manufacturing products uh, to the rest of the country and the world. So that means we have a lot of infrastructure to maintain and improve. Uh, the bridge area is the one that gets the most discussion. Uh, in Iowa, we have about 4,500 bridges in poor condition. Uh, that doesn't mean they're unsafe, but in many cases that means they're bridges that have load restrictions and eventually may have to be closed uh, because of conditions. Uh, most of those, the great majority of those are on the county road system. So uh, this infrastructure bill does include dedicated bridge funding for states. So that will be a tremendous impact in, in our bridge issues. But we also have a lot of road needs uh, at the state level. We have a lot of needs in investing in our pavements and also some interstate corridors. Interstate 380 corridor between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City has been a, a real priority corridor because of the huge demand with commuting traffic and safety issues. So we need to rehabilitate and widen that corridor. National engineering groups um, have rated Iowa with pretty mediocre grades. As you mentioned, the 4,000 bridges. Will this new infrastructure spending and state plans raise our grade nationally? Yeah, sure, it should across the board. Uh, this is a real significant increase in, in revenue if this passes and is implemented. And so again, it'll help roads and bridges, but it's not just roads and bridges that are uh, have needs in Iowa, our transit system, about half of our public transit fleet in the state exceeds federal useful life standards. So this will provide funding to help replace some vehicles. Uh, we have airport needs, of course, here in Des Moines. Uh, there's uh, a real need to replace and modernize the terminal at Des Moines. And there I thought, excuse me, I thought you had to raise the passenger fee in order to get that done. Well, that's one option. That, but will uh, this infrastructure bill eliminate the need to raise uh, passenger well, fees? It, it's a little hard to say right now, but what this bill does is it includes a $5 billion discretionary program at the federal level for terminal uh, projects. So that could be another option that the Des Moines Airport could consider. Okay. Uh, Stu Anderson, in 2015, the Iowa legislature and the governor approved an increase in Iowa's gas tax. Um, how has that impacted roads and bridges in Iowa? Yeah, that's been tremendously impactful in a positive way. That fuel tax increase that took effect March 1st of 2015 generally raised the gas tax about 10 cents per gallon. And so that provided over $200 million a year for DOT, city and county improvements. 
and it's actually allowed uh, everybody to make some progress on the bridge uh, condition challenges and, and road improvements. Uh, just at, uh, on the state system alone, our Iowa Transportation Commission has prioritized uh, investing in pavements and bridges and has made real progress and to the point now where uh, because of the gas tax and other prioritization of funding, uh, we now just have 32 poor condition bridges on the state system. So it's been very impactful. How about the future of the gas tax? Cars are being more fuel efficient. Electric cars don't use gas at all. Uh, how long, how sustainable is ga the gas tax as a major revenue source for the state? And what are the other options moving forward, looking ahead 5, 10, 15 years down the road? Yeah, so I, I would make two comments on that. First is uh, the legislature, again, was very proactive and uh, initially directing the DOT to do some assessment about what the impact of more electric vehicles in the fleet would have on the state road use tax fund and, and directed us to make some recommendations, which we did. And the legislature in 2019 implemented some user fees for electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, not in a way to generate more revenue, but to be revenue neutral so that they're paying uh, an equivalent amount to what they would pay uh, as gasoline-powered vehicles. So that was really important. Do we need to raise those fees and gas taxes? Well, it's a little premature to say that. Of course, we need to see what happens with this infrastructure bill and how that addresses our needs. Also, uh, the legislature has directed the DOT to do a study every five years looking at what our road needs are in the state and the ability of existing revenue streams to meet that. And that next study is due this calendar year. So in there, we'll have a better assessment of what the impact of the infrastructure bill is and what our funding shortfall is. Well, but it's nevertheless, this infrastru federal infrastructure bill could uh, delay the need for Iowa to raise gas tax or electrical fees, right? It's very possible because in our assessment, we look at all the revenue streams that come in and what the needs are. Jim McCauley, are electric vehicles going to pay their fair share? <laughs> Uh, great question, and uh, I drive, uh, to, uh, I have two of them in my family, and uh, pluggable, and uh, so uh, we, we feel like it was an economically attractive decision to have per made that purchase, uh, but uh, overall, you know, I think that uh, 20 years from now, we will see the economic benefits of an electrified transportation system, and those benefits are directly related, uh, of course, to the need to... Uh, uh, green our uh, electric generation side uh, and uh, we, you know, one of the main major motivations for wind and solar of course are decarbonization that what's that's what gives a lot of attention to, to that uh, effort but it's also economic it's the economic generation resource today and, uh, and, and there's uh, an infrastructure question there too because if we're going to have more electric vehicles. President Biden set the goal of half of the fleet by 2035. We need more charging stations, right? That's right, yeah. So certainly uh, this is an, ad an additional load on the electric grid, uh, and we need to be prepared to, to handle that as it comes forward. And this infrastructure bill includes a new formula program through USDOT uh, with dedicated funding for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. The early numbers show that it would, would mean perhaps $10 million a year over five years for that program. Jim McCauley, quick question. We had a couple guests on this program last week, I think, talking about ethanol. What's this uh, electrical vehicles and what the president's talking about going to do to the ethanol industry in our state? Put them out of business? Well, I'm not sure that there's been really good analysis on my side about the implica implications for ethanol. Certainly, uh, you know, it's a, it's a fuel uh, mixed uh, d d derivative, so uh, th th there could be, um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not well positioned to comment on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, back to the question about charging stations. Um, do they need to be positioned every I mean how how is this how am I going to drive from Des Moines to Denver if there aren't enough charging stations so it's certainly uh, an evolution uh, I think we're going to have to see uh, we're going to have to wait on the charging stations to be built in a, at a level that uh, enables uh, you know uh, the avoidance of the problem that you're suggesting so is this a chicken and an egg what comes first yeah. I mean, are people going to be reluctant to buy electrical vehicles if they can't drive them as far as they're able to, to drive a vehicle that has liquid fuel? 
Right. So, I mean, you can also do both. And this is a very attractive uh, way to avoid that problem. And I think the, the interim time period where we, that, that we're in right now, we'll probably see a lot of purchase of vehicles that, uh, that, that uh, are uh, fueled by gasoline, uh, petroleum-based, as well as electricity. Mr. Anderson, so. who, should, who should pay for all this, uh, these charging stations? Is that the Iowa DOT who should make that service available at rest stops and other places? Or is this something we ought to look to uh, private sector to, to do? Well, I think it'll be a, be a mix. Certainly this infrastructure bill would provide significant federal funds to support that. The, uh, the, the idea is that that would provide up to 80% federal funding support and then the 20% match. We'd envision, again, it's very preliminary, but that would come from the private sector. At this point, we don't have state funds available that would go to support that directly. So Kay's not going to be able to pull over in the rest stop and plug in. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now, uh, there is a federal prohibition on putting charging infrastructure at rest areas uh, and charging electricity for them. So. And, and Stu, to pin a bow on the circle back to the funding question, if the president's goal of half of the fleet being electric cars by 35, what does that do to revenue in the state if, if we were to get there where half of the vehicles aren't using gas? Well, we, we really feel that the action by the legislature in 2019 has addressed that issue. So we really feel that the user fees in place will address that. And the other piece of the infrastructure bill is the uh, plan to look at a national pilot study for uh, alternative user fees, like a mileage-based user fee system. So that's kind of a longer-term discussion. Jim McCauley, I don't know how well this fits in your area of expertise, but another area of the infrastructure bill is the lock and dam system, uh, and that's something I know from covering the news in this state for a while has been talked about a, uh, for a long time, and we'll, we'll ask you both about this, but do you have any thoughts on the needs on the lock and dam system and, and how that uh, that upkeep is, is essential to I think our I, state? Yeah, so I'm mainly focused on the electric grid, mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of inter energy infrastructure, and I'll maybe pass that question but to so, Stu. So is yeah. hydropower got any future? In Iowa, pretty flat state. So. Yeah, well, so there is a bit of hydro in Iowa, but uh, there's not a significant uh, opportunity there for building out. But uh, there is north of us, uh, particularly in Canada, and so there's a lot of opportunity there to build out Canadian hydro and bring it in through. But here is here lies a need, another need for transmission. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked about the lock and dam system. That has been a state of I, Iowa priority for quite a few years. Our lock and dam system is probably a, an underappreciated, uh, vitally important mode of transportation to ship Iowa grain to the rest of the world. It really provides Iowa an advantage in low transportation costs. I believe about 60% of our grain exports travel down the Mississippi River uh, to the export market. Just the locks and dams along the Iowa border uh, require about a billion dollars of investment just to make up with past deferred maintenance and do rehabilitation work, not even talking about expansion. And any single point failure of a lock and dam shuts down the entire river. So uh, that's vitally important and we're hopeful some money out of this infrastructure bill goes towards that. Um, Jim McCauley, let's shift to solar. There's some big installations going on in the Grinnell area and some other areas of the state. What role will solar play in providing electricity in Iowa? So there's uh, certainly a great opportunity there in two different ways. Uh, one is, as you say, at what we refer to as the utility scale size solar plant, uh, which typically would connect at the higher voltage level, transmission level. Uh, the other is on our roofs, and uh, so many people are interested in uh, putting solar panels on the roof. Uh, we call that distributed energy resources, or DER. And uh, so, uh, but you know, and there's a lot of interest in uh, distributed energy resources, and and for good reason. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on a percentage basis, we're probably going to see most of our solar energy coming from utility scale plants in the future. It's just more economic uh, to do that. So, what role does uh, the tax incentive play in the development of the solar industry, and, and those have gone away at the state level. Certainly a large role, at the, uh, particularly at the distributed level. Uh, it's really not an economically wise choice to put solar panels on your roof without uh, some level of subsidy. 
uh, it's more economically attractive to pay the 10 cents per kilowatt hour that uh, is typical in mid-American energy regions. Do we have the infrastructure that we need to take advantage of solar and wind power? Uh, I'm told by uh, uh, that that some the, the, we need special wires to get solar and wind energy from out of the heartland into Chicago and other places where it's going to be used. Is there anything in this legislation to help do something about that? Is that a problem? Uh, it is a huge problem. Uh, today, uh, our wind infrastructure in Iowa is, we all know, very, very large and growing, but it has not grown as much as it could have and, sh and, and would have had the, the transmission system had more capacity. So this is not necessarily the fault of anyone. It's just a function of where we are in terms of our build out on transmission. The infrastructure bill has put about $12 billion into facilitating the construction of new transmission in the United States. Now, that ends up being something on the order of maybe 1,500 miles of line of high voltage transmission lines. Uh, we have about 200,000 miles of high voltage transmission lines in the United States today. So it's. It's not huge, but it's significant. And people and, just love having them in their backyard, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> uh, Sue Anderson, the Interstate 80 is obviously a main uh, artery through our state and critical for commercial travel. Um, what's, what's the future of I-80? Does, does DOT see that that will need to be expanded to six lanes at some point in the future? Is, is four lanes going to be enough? What, what, what's the future of I-80 look like? Yeah, we have done planning studies looking at I-80, and as you mentioned, I-80 is a major freight corridor for the whole country, and we see tremendous volume of semi-trucks. Uh, in some cases, up to 40% of the traffic is all semi-trucks. So yes, there are some areas that will require six-lane improvements, primarily in eastern Iowa initially. Uh, the commission has programmed some funding to do some of that work uh, east of Iowa City. Uh, Continuing all the way to Davenport and Illinois River, we'll be looking at making those improvements eventually and probably working its way to Des Moines. Western Iowa, the traffic's a little lower, so that will, will take some time. But uh, definitely I-80 and even I-35 in some stretches will need some major improvements. And, and what's, the, what's the time range on something like that? That seems like such a huge project. I mean, I, and obviously you're still just kind of in the very earliest of stages of thinking about something like that. What, what's, a, what's a time frame on something like that? Yeah, we'd probably be looking, it's 20 years or so to make significant improvements from Iowa City to Davenport. Of course, a little bit of that depends on funding, but, but yes, it does take time to make those large improvements. What about Davenport to Council Bluffs? <laughs> the the entire lane? corridor? Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, um, probably less, definitely less so in western Iowa. You know, I think a little bit of that is going to depend on what happens with technology. As we see automated vehicles, we've done some analysis where we think uh, that could alleviate some of those capacity needs as you have vehicles that can drive closer together, maybe a little narrower lanes. So that might uh, really have some influence here in the next 20 years as well. So what happens when you're building as you are at that I-80, 380 interchange, are you planning for that already? Because that thing seems huge. Are you planning for the I-80 to be six lanes there? A absolutely. And the, and the new bridges on I-80 too? Absolutely, yep. Particularly the bridges. Bridges have a very long lifespan, so any bridge work we're doing on I-80, we're preparing for the future. And the I-80, I-380 interchange is, is a really good example of an important project because of the freight movement on that corridor. Uh, the existing interchange just had really um, challenges with weavy movements that caused problems for semi-trucks. So that was a really important project. But yes, that is built to handle uh, wider pavements in the future. You mentioned freight. Yes. Um, freight flying into Iowa. Are the state's airports equipped to deal with this demand for people to have a package delivered in a cardboard box to their front door? Yeah, cargo uh, definitely is an important component of uh, the aviation system, although definitely much less than what we see on the highway system just because of the cost. But certain types of cargo uh, really is important to hand uh, move by the aviation system. And we primarily see that at the Des Moines and the Eastern Iowa Airport over in Cedar Rapids. Um, you know, probably the bigger challenge for our airports, particularly our commercial service airports, are the passenger demands. With, with COVID, those went way down. We saw passenger counts at our airports down 95%. But in June, they were back up to about 80% of the pre-COVID levels. Jim McCauley. Am I going to be able to drive an electric car, whether it's 
four lane or six lane <laughs> from Davenport to Council Bluffs in the near future without stopping? Certainly, yeah, that's, that's here today. Uh, the cost of the purchase the necessary to make that happen is a little high, but costs are coming down. Uh, the Tesla would make that uh, drive no problem. And surveys show that, excuse me, Kate, surveys show that one of the big impediments to people buying electric vehicles is they worry about, you know, getting caught out on the interstate without a place to charge. Is that a big problem? Certainly. I mean, with kind of uh, going back uh, to our earlier discussion, uh, that's where you really need to use, uh, have the ability to use both uh, gasoline and, and uh, electrification, electrified transportation. Okay. Yeah. We're done. We're done. We're out of time. <laughs> okay. Thank you both right. for, uh, for being with us today. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Good discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. And we'll be back next week with another edition of Iowa Press as we explore issues of racial justice and equality in Iowa. Joining us are Betty Andrews, president of the Iowa-Nebraska NAACP, and Justin Lewis, a community activist and founder of Des Moines Selma. That's Iowa Press next week at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night and noon on Sunday. For all of us here at Iowa PBS, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.